Lewis's Medical Surgical Nursing, 11th edition, Chapter 29, Assessment, Hematologic System. Hematology is the study of blood and blood-forming tissues. This includes the bone marrow, blood, spleen, and lymph system. You need a basic knowledge of hematology to be able to evaluate several important concepts in the clinical setting. A functioning hematologic system is needed to support the patient's ability to transport oxygen, O2, and carbon dioxide, CO2, maintain intravascular volume, coagulate blood, and combat infections. Structures and functions of hematologic system. Bone marrow. Blood cell production, hematopoiesis, occurs within the bone marrow. Bone marrow is the soft material that fills the central core of bones. There are two types of bone marrow, yellow adipose and red hematopoietic. Red marrow actively makes blood cells. In adults, red marrow is found primarily in the flat and irregular bones, such as the ends of long bones, pelvic bones, vertebrae, sacrum, sternum, ribs, flat cranial bones, and scapulae. All three types of blood cells, RBCs, WBCs, and platelets, develop from a common hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow. The hematopoietic stem cell is best described as an immature blood cell that can self-renew and differentiate into hematopoietic precursor cells. Several types of blood cells form as the cells mature and differentiate. The bone marrow responds by a negative feedback system to the need for specific blood cells by increasing that cell's production. Various factors or cytokines, e.g. erythropoietin, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, GCSF, stem cell factor, thrombopoietin, stimulate the bone marrow. This results in differentiation of the stem cells into one of the committed hematopoietic cells, e.g. RBC. For example, when tissue hypoxia occurs, the kidney secretes erythropoietin. It circulates to the bone marrow and causes proerythroblasts to differentiate in the bone marrow. Blood. Blood is a type of connective tissue that has three major functions, transportation, regulation, and protection. Blood has two major components, plasma and blood cells. In an adult weighing between 150 and 180 pounds, the volume of blood is usually between 4.7 and 5.5 liters, 5 to 6 quarts. Plasma. About 55% of blood is plasma. Plasma is composed mainly of water. It also contains proteins, electrolytes, gases, nutrients, e.g. glucose, amino acids, lipids, and waste. The term serum refers to plasma minus its clotting factors. Plasma proteins include albumin, globulin, and clotting factors, mostly fibrinogen. Albumin is a protein that helps maintain oncotic pressure in the blood. The liver makes most plasma proteins. The exception is antibodies, immunoglobulins. They are made by plasma cells. Blood cells. About 45% of the blood is composed of formed elements or blood cells. The three types of blood cells are erythrocytes, RBCs, leukocytes, WBCs, and thrombocytes, platelets. The primary function of RBCs is O2 transportation. WBCs help protect the body from infection. Platelets promote blood coagulation. Erythrocytes. The primary functions of RBCs include transport of gases, both O2 and CO2, and assistance in maintaining acid-base balance. RBCs are flexible cells with a unique biconcave shape. 
This flexibility allows a cell to change its shape so that it can easily pass through tiny capillaries. The cell membrane is thin to facilitate diffusion of gases. RBCs are primarily composed of a large molecule called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a complex protein iron compound composed of heme, an iron compound, and globin, a simple protein. It binds with O2 and CO2. As RBCs circulate through the capillaries surrounding alveoli within the lung, O2 attaches to iron on the hemoglobin. We refer to this O2 bound hemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin. It gives arterial blood its bright red appearance. As RBCs flow to body tissues, O2 detaches from the hemoglobin and diffuses from the capillary into tissue cells. CO2 diffuses from tissue cells into the capillary, attaches to the globin part of hemoglobin, and is transported to the lungs for removal. Hemoglobin also acts as a buffer and plays a role in maintaining acid-base balance. This buffering function is described in Chapter 16. Erythropoiesis, the process of RBC production, is regulated by cellular O2 requirements and general metabolic activity. Erythropoiesis is stimulated by hypoxia and controlled by erythropoietin a glycoprotein growth factor made and released primarily by the kidney. Erythropoietin stimulates the bone marrow to increase RBC production. We make about 2.5 million RBCs per second. The normal lifespan of RBCs is about 120 days. The availability of nutrients influences erythropoiesis. Many essential nutrients are needed for erythropoiesis. These include protein, iron, folate, folic acid, cobalamin, vitamin B12, riboflavin, vitamin B2, pyridoxine, vitamin B6, pantothenic acid, niacin, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, copper, and vitamin E. Endocrine hormones such as thyroxine, corticosteroids, and testosterone also affect RBC production. For example, hypothyroidism is often associated with anemia. Several distinct cell types evolved during RBC maturation. The reticulocyte is an immature RBC. Reticulocytes can develop into mature RBCs within 48 hours of release into the circulation. A mature RBC lacks a nucleus and cannot undergo mitotic division. Assessing the number of reticulocytes is a useful way to evaluate the rate and adequacy of RBC production. Hemolysis, destruction of RBCs by monocytes and macrophages, removes abnormal, defective, damaged, and old RBCs from circulation. Hemolysis normally occurs in the bone marrow liver, and spleen. Because one of the components of RBCs is bilirubin, hemolysis of these cells results in increased bilirubin the body must process. When hemolysis occurs by normal mechanisms, the liver conjugates and excretes all the bilirubin in bile. Leukocytes. Leukocytes, WBCs, appear white when separated from blood. Like the RBCs, WBCs originate from stem cells within the bone marrow. This may eventually reside in the thymus or secondary lymphoid tissues, such as the spleen, lymph nodes, and pyre patches. There are several types of WBCs. Each has a different function. WBCs that have granules in the cytoplasm are granulocytes, also known as poly morphonuclear leukocytes. Granulocytes include neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. WBCs that do not have granules in the cytoplasm are 
agranulocytes. They include lymphocytes, monocytes, and natural killer cells. Lymphocytes and monocytes are mononuclear cells because they have only one discrete nucleus. WBCs have a widely variable lifespan. Granulocytes may live for only hours. Some T lymphocytes may live for years. Granulocytes. The primary function of the granulocytes is phagocytosis, a process by which WBCs engulf any unwanted organism and digest and kill it. They can migrate through vessel walls and to the sites where they are needed. The neutrophil is the most common type of granulocyte, making up 60% to 70% of all WBCs. Neutrophils are the primary phago acidic cells involved in acute inflammatory responses. Once they engulf the pathogen, they die in one to two days. Hematopoietic growth factors, e.g. GCSF, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF, stimulate neutrophil production and maturation. We call a mature neutrophil a segmented neutrophil, or SEG, or polysegmented neutrophil. Because the nucleus is segmented into two to five lobes connected by strands. An immature neutrophil is a band for the band appearance of the nucleus. Although band cells are sometimes found in the peripheral circulation of normal people and are capable of phagocytosis, the mature neutrophil is much more effective. An increase in neutrophils in the blood is a common indicator of infection and tissue injury. Eosinophils make up only 2-4% to of all WBCs. They have a similar but reduced ability for phagocytosis. One of their primary functions is to engulf antigen antibody complexes formed during an allergic response. High eosinophil levels occur with some cancers such as Hodgkin's lymphoma. In parasitic infections and in various skin diseases and connective tissue disorders. Basophils make up less than 2% of all WBCs. They have cytoplasmic granules that contain chemical mediators such as heparin and histamine. A basophil responds to stimulation by an antigen or by tissue injury by releasing substances from the granules. This is part of the response seen on allergic and inflammatory reactions. Mast cells are like basophils, but they reside in connective tissues. They play a key role in inflammation, permeability of blood vessels, and smooth muscle contraction. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes make up 20 to 25% of the WBCs in the blood. They form the basis of the cellular and humoral immune responses. Two lymphocyte subtypes are B cells and T cells. T cell precursors originate in the bone marrow. They migrate to the thymus gland for further differentiation into T cells. Natural killer, NK cells, are lymphocytes that kill virus-infected cells and activate T cells in phagocytes. They do not need prior exposure to antigens. Dendritic cells are the primary phagocytic cells in the peripheral organs and skin. Most lymphocytes briefly circulate in the blood and reside in lymphoid and other tissues. Details of lymphocyte function are discussed in Chapter 13. Monocytes. Monocytes, the other type of agranular WBC, make up about 3 to 8 percent of the total WBCs. Monocytes are potent phagocytic cells that ingest small or large masses of matter, such as bacteria, dead cells, tissue debris, and old or defective RBCs. These cells are present in the blood for only a brief time before they migrate into the tissues and become macrophages. In addition, to macrophages that have differentiated from monocytes, tissues also have resident macrophages. These resident macrophages have special names, e.g. Kupfer cells in the liver, osteoclasts in the bone, alveolar macrophages in the lung. They protect the body from pathogens at these entry points and are more phagocytic than monocytes. 
Macrophages interact with lymphocytes to facilitate humoral and cellular immune responses. Thrombocytes. The primary function of thrombocytes, or platelets, is to start the clotting process by producing an initial platelet plug at the site of injury. Platelets circulate suspended in plasma in an unactivated state. It must be available in enough numbers and be structurally and metabolically sound for blood clotting to occur. Platelet activation starts at the site of any capillary damage. Increasing numbers of platelets accumulate to form an initial platelet plug that is stabilized with clotting factors. About one third of the platelets in the body are stored in the spleen. Platelets originate from stem cells within the bone marrow. The stem cell undergoes differentiation by transforming into a megakaryocyte, which fragments into platelets. Platelet production is partly regulated by thrombopoietin, TPO, a growth factor that acts on bone marrow to stimulate platelet production. TPO is primarily made in the liver. During inflammation, interleukin-6, IL-6, causes us to make more TPO, which increases production of platelets and potential thrombosis. Typically, platelets have a lifespan of only 8 to 11 days. Normal iron metabolism. Our iron requirement is 25 milligrams daily. We get iron from food and dietary supplements. Our body absorbs only one milligram of every 10 to 20 milligrams of iron we eat. The rest comes from the continued recycling of iron from RBCs. As part of normal iron metabolism, iron is recycled after macrophages in the liver and spleen phagocytize or ingest and destroy old and damaged RBCs. After dietary iron is absorbed in the duodenum and proximal jejunum, it is transported through the plasma by transferrin, figure 29.3. Transferrin is made in the liver. How much iron is bound to transferrin is a reliable indicator of the iron supply for developing RBCs. About two-thirds of total body iron is bound to heme in RBCs, hemoglobin, and muscle cells, myoglobin. The other one-third of iron is stored as ferritin and hemosiderin, degraded form of ferritin, in the bone marrow, spleen, liver, and macrophages. When we do not replace stored iron, hemoglobin production is reduced. Normally, there is very little iron loss except from blood loss. We lose about 3% daily in urine, sweat, bile, and epithelial cells in the GI tract. Normal clotting mechanisms. Hemostasis describes the arrest of bleeding. This process is important in minimizing blood loss when various body structures are injured. The sequence of events includes 1. Vascular injury and subendothelial exposure, 2. Adhesion, 3. Activation, 4. Aggregation, 5. Platelet plug formation, and 6. Clot retraction and dissolution. Vascular injury and subendothelial exposure. When a blood vessel is injured, an immediate local vasoconstrictive response occurs. Vasoconstriction reduces the leakage of blood from the vessel by restricting the vessel size and pressing the endothelial surfaces together. The latter reaction enhances vessel wall stickiness and keeps the vessel closed after vasoconstriction subsides. Vascular spasm may last for 20 to 30 minutes. This allows time for the body to activate the platelet response and plasma clotting factors. The platelet response and plasma clotting factors are triggered by endothelial injury and the release of substances such as thromboxane A2, TXA2. Platelets begin to fill endothelial gaps. Adhesion. The loss of endothelial cells exposes adhesive glycoproteins such as collagen, and von Willebrand factor, VWF, to which more platelets adhere. The stickiness is termed adhesiveness. 
The formation of clumps is termed aggregation or agglutination. Activation. The interaction described previously causes the platelets to undergo an activation process. This leads to changes in platelet shape. The platelets then can bind adhesive proteins, including fibrinogen and VWF. Release of various platelet granules, including adenosine phosphate, ADP, recruits and activates other platelets, clotting factors, and growth factors. Platelet lipoproteins stimulate necessary conversions in the clotting process. Aggregation. Platelet aggregation is stimulated by TXA and ADP, which induce fibrinogen receptors on the platelet. The formation of a visible fibrin clot on the platelet plug is the conclusion of a complex series of reactions involving different clotting coagulation factors. We label plasma clotting factors with both names and Roman numerals. Plasma proteins circulate in inactive forms until stimulated to start clotting through one of two pathways, intrinsic or extrinsic. The intrinsic pathway is activated by collagen exposure from endothelial injury when the blood vessel is damaged. The extrinsic pathway is activated when tissue factor or tissue thromboplastin is released extravascularly from injured tissues. Regardless of how we begin to clot, coagulation ultimately follows the same final common pathway of the clotting cascade. Thrombin in the common pathway is the most powerful enzyme in the coagulation process. It converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which is an essential part of a blood clot. Platelet plug formation. The final blood clot is a meshwork of protein strands that stabilizes the platelet plug and traps other cells such as RBCs, phagocytes, and microorganisms. Clot retraction and dissolution. Just as some blood elements foster coagulation, procoagulants, others interfere with clotting, anticoagulants. This counter-mechanism to blood clotting keeps blood in its fluid state. Antithrombin activity, vessel and platelet activity, and fibrinolysis contribute to anticoagulation. As the name implies, antithrombins keep blood in a fluid state by antagonizing thrombin, a powerful coagulant. Endogenous heparin, antithrombin 3, protein C, and protein S are examples of anticoagulants. Second means of keeping blood in its fluid form is fibrinolysis, a process resulting in the dissolution of the fibrin clot. The fibrinolytic system starts when plasminogen is activated by substances such as tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, and urokinase like plasminogen activator, UPA, to plasmin. Thrombin is one of the substances that can activate the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, thereby promoting fibrinolysis. The plasmin attacks either fibrin or fibrinogen by splitting the molecules into smaller elements known as fibrin split products, FSPs, or fibrin degradation products, FDPs. You can find more about FSPs in Table 29.8 and in the discussion of disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, in Chapter 30. Excessive fibrinolysis predisposes the patient to bleeding. In this situation, bleeding results from the destruction of fibrin in platelet plugs or from the anticoagulation effects of increased FSPs. Increased FSPs lead to impaired platelet aggregation, reduced prothrombin, and an inability to stabilize fibrin. Spleen. The spleen is the largest lymphoid organ. It is found in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen. The spleen has four major functions, hematopoietic, filtration, immunologic, and storage. The hematopoietic function is shown by the spleen's ability to make RBCs during fetal development. 
The filtration function is shown by the spleen's ability to remove old and defective RVCs from the circulation by the mononuclear phagocyte system. Filtration also involves the reuse of iron. The spleen can catabolize hemoglobin released by hemolysis and return the iron part of the hemoglobin to the bone marrow for reuse. The spleen plays a vital role in filtering circulating bacteria, especially encapsulating organisms such as gram-positive cocci. The spleen's rich supply of lymphocytes, monocytes, and stored immunoglobulins plays a role in immunologic function. The storage function is reflected in its role as a storage site for RBCs and platelets. The spleen can store more than 300 milliliters of blood. We store about one-third of platelets in the spleen. Lymph system. The lymph system, consisting of lymph fluid, lymphatic capillaries, ducts, and lymph nodes, carries fluid from the interstitial spaces to the blood. It is through the lymph that proteins and fat from the GI tract and certain hormones can return to the circulatory system. The lymph system also returns excess interstitial fluid to the blood. Lymph fluid is pale yellow interstitial fluid that has diffused through lymphatic capillary walls. The lymphatic vessels collect interstitial fluid from the tissues and transport it as lymph through vessels and eventually to the thoracic duct, which drains into the superior vena cava. The formation of lymph fluid increases when interstitial fluid increases, thereby forcing more fluid into the lymph system. When too much interstitial fluid develops, or when something interferes with the reabsorption of lymph, lymphedema develops. Lymphedema may occur as a complication of mastectomy or lumpectomy with dissection of axillary nodes. In this situation, lymphedema is caused by the obstruction of lymph flow from the removal of lymph nodes. The lymphatic capillaries are thin-walled vessels that have an irregular diameter. They are larger than blood capillaries and do not have valves. The lymph nodes are also part of the lymphatic system. They are round, oval, or bean-shaped. Structurally, the nodes are small clumps of lymphatic tissue. They are found in groups along lymph vessels at various sites. There are more than 200 lymph nodes throughout the body, with the greatest number being in the abdomen surrounding the GI tract. They vary in size according to their location. Lymph nodes are situated both superficially and deep. We can palpate superficial nodes. Evaluating deep nodes requires radiologic examination. A primary function of lymph nodes is filtration of pathogens and foreign particles that are carried by lymph to the nodes. Liver. The liver has metabolic, secretory, vascular, and storage functions. It makes all the procoagulants that are essential to hemostasis and blood coagulation and secretes bilirubin and bile. It stores iron that exceeds tissue needs, which can occur with frequent blood transfusions or diseases that cause iron overload. Hepcidin, made by the liver, is a key regulator of iron balance. Iron overload or inflammation stimulates hepcidin synthesis. Hepcidin inhibits the release of stored iron from enterocytes, in the intestines and macrophages. So when iron is deficient, hepatocytes make less hepcidin. This results in the release of stored iron and an increase in dietary absorption. Gerontologic considerations. Effects of aging on hematologic system. Aging leads to a decrease in bone marrow mass and cellularity 
and an increase in bone marrow fat. 90% of the marrow space is occupied by hematopoietic tissue at birth. This is reduced to 50% at age 30 and 30% at age 70. Although the older adult can still maintain adequate blood cell levels, the reduced reserve capacity leaves the older adult more vulnerable to possible problems with clotting, transporting O2, and fighting infection, especially during periods of increased demand. This contributes to an older adult having a decreased ability to compensate for an acute or chronic illness. Hemoglobin levels may begin to decrease in both men and women after middle age with low normal levels seen in most older people. Total serum iron, total iron binding capacity, and intestinal iron absorption are all decreased in older adults. The RBC plasma membranes are more fragile. This may account for a slight increase in mean corpuscular volume, MCV and a slight decrease in mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, MCHC, of RBCs in some older adults. While iron deficiency may cause low hemoglobin levels, other factors such as GI bleeding, renal disease, testosterone deficiency, or bone marrow dysfunction should be ruled out. In 30 to 40 percent of cases, there is no specific cause of anemia. This is called unexplained anemia in the elderly. Cytokine levels may be high, but the amount of inflammation is not enough to increase hepcidin levels. Healthy older patients are not able to make reticulocytes in response to hemorrhage or hypoxemia as well as younger adults. This is likely due to a blunted response to erythropoietin. Aging generally does not affect the total WBC count and differential. There may be a slight increase in neutrophils and a decrease in lymphocytes. However, the function of lymphocytes decreases, blunting the response to infection. During an infection, the older adult may have only a minimal elevation in the total WBC count. This suggests decreased bone marrow reserve of granulocytes in older adults and reflects the possible impaired stimulation of hematopoiesis. Older adults are at higher risk for developing neutropenia from treatments. The number of platelets is unaffected by the aging process, but functionally they may have increased adhesiveness. Clotting factors increase with age. Thus, aging is associated with an increased chance of clotting problems such as venous thromboembolism. Changes in vascular integrity related to aging can manifest as easy bruising. Assessment of hematologic system. Much of the evaluation of the hematologic system is based on a thorough health history and presenting signs and symptoms. Subjective data, important health information, past health history. Determine if the patient has had prior hematologic problems. Ask about problems with anemia, bleeding problems, and blood disorders. Ask about related medical conditions such as malabsorption or liver, e.g. hepatitis, cirrhosis, kidney or spleen problems. Patients may have received a solid organ transplant, may have lost a spleen to traumatic injury, or may have a history of IV, drug, or alcohol use that affects their risk for hematologic problems. A history of recent or recurrent infections or problems with blood clotting is important to note. Medications. A complete medication history is an important part of a hematologic assessment. Ask about the use of vitamins, herbal products, or dietary supplements. Many medications may interfere with normal hematologic function. Those on long-term anticoagulant therapy, such as warfarin, are at risk for bleeding problems. Chemotherapy drugs used to treat cancer and antiretroviral agents used to treat human 
immunodeficiency virus infection may cause bone marrow depression. A patient previously treated with chemotherapy agents, particularly alkylating agents, has a higher risk for developing a secondary cancer of leukemia or lymphoma. Surgery or other treatments. Ask the patient about specific surgical procedures. This includes splenectomy, tumor removal, prosthetic heart valve replacement, surgical excision of the duodenum, where iron absorption occurs, partial or total gastrectomy, which removes parietal cells, thus reducing intrinsic factor needed for the absorption of cobalamin, vitamin B12, gastric bypass, the duodenum may be bypassed and parietal cell surface area decreased, and ileal resection, where cobalamin absorption takes place. Assess how wound healing progressed postoperatively and if and when any bleeding problems occurred in relation to the surgery. Discuss wound healing and bleeding as responses to injuries, including minor trauma, and dental extractions. Determine the number of previous blood transfusions and any complications with administration. The risk for transfusion reactions and iron overload increases with the number of blood transfusions. Functional health patterns. Health perception, health management. Ask the patient to describe a usual and present state of health. Gather complete demographic data, including age, gender, race, and ethnic background. Ask if there is any family history of hematologic problems. Taking a family health history, ask about jaundice, anemia, cancer, RBC disorders such as sickle cell disease, and bleeding disorders such as hemophilia and clotting disorders. Assess risk factors such as alcohol and cigarette use that may disrupt a hematologic system. Alcohol is caustic to the GI mucosa and can cause damage that results in GI bleeding. Esophageal varices and decreased absorption of cobalamin and other nutrients. Chronic alcohol users often have vitamin deficiencies. Alcohol exerts a damaging effect on platelet function and the liver, where we make clotting factors. Consequently, Bleeding problems can develop and should be expected in cases of known chronic alcohol use. Illicit drug use is important to determine, since many of these drugs may affect hematopoiesis. Cigarette smoking increases low-density lipoprotein, LDL cholesterol, and levels of CO2, leading to hypoxia and changing the anticoagulant properties of the endothelium. Smoking increases platelet reactivity plasma, fibrinogen, hematocrit, and blood viscosity. Nutritional metabolic pattern. Obtain the patient's weight. Determine if the patient has had anorexia, nausea, vomiting, or oral discomfort. A dietary history may give clues about the cause of anemia. Iron, cobalamin, and folic acid are needed for the development of RBCs. Iron and folic acid deficiencies are associated with inadequate intake of foods such as meat, fish, eggs, leafy greens and vegetables, legumes, citrus fruits, and whole grain and enriched bread, cereals, and rice. A diet with foods high in iron may offset folic acid deficiencies. Hematemesis, bright red, brown, or black vomitus, is a manifestation of an underlying problem and always needs investigating. Peptic ulcer disease is a common cause of hematemesis. Explore any changes in the skin's texture, color, or temperature. Ask about bleeding gum tissue or bleeding from anywhere on the body. Ask about any lumps or swelling in the neck, armpits, or groin. Specifically, ask what the lumps feel like, i.e. hard or soft, tender or non-tender, and if they are mobile or fixed. Primary lymph tumors are usually not painful. A non-tender, consistently swollen lymph node may be a sign of a cancer, such as Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Enlarged, tender lymph nodes are usually associated with an acute infection. Explore any reports of fever. Determine if the patient currently has a fever, recurring fever, chills, or night sweats. Ask patients if they have a history of heart or lung diseases. 
cardiovascular problems such as valvular disease or hypertension may predispose patients to hemolysis. Many medications used to treat cardiovascular disease can cause problems with hematopoietic cell production or coagulation. Lung problems that lead to hypoxemia may cause chronic stimulation of erythropoietin and result in polycythemia, excess RBCs. Elimination pattern. Ask if there has been blood in the urine or stool or if black tarry stools have occurred. Ask the patient if they have had a recent stool tested for occult blood or colonoscopy. Activity exercise pattern. Because fatigue is a prominent symptom in many hematologic problems, ask about feelings of tiredness. Determine any weakness or feelings of heavy extremities. Assess for apathy, malaise, dyspnea, or palpitations. Note any change in the patient's ability to perform regular exercise and or activities of daily living especially as they relate to his history of falling. Sleep rest pattern. Determine whether the patient feels rested after a night's sleep. Fatigue secondary to a hematologic problem often does not resolve after sleep. Cognitive perceptual pattern. Assess for any arthralgia, joint pain, that may be caused by a hematologic problem. Pain in the joint may occur with an autoimmune disorder such as rheumatoid arthritis, may occur with gout from increased uric acid production due to hematologic cancer or hemolytic anemia. Aching bones may result from pressure or expanding bone marrow with diseases such as leukemia. Hemarthrosis, blood in a joint, occurs in the patient with bleeding disorders and can be painful. Note any paresthesias, numbness, and tingling as they may be related to a hematologic disorder. Assess for any changes in vision, hearing, taste, or mental status. Self-perception, self-concept pattern. Determine the effect of the health problem on the patient's perception of self and personal abilities. Assess the effect of certain problems, such as bruising, petechiae, and lymph node swelling on the patient's personal appearance. Role relationship pattern. Ask the patient about any past or present occupational or household exposures to radiation or chemicals. If such exposure has occurred, determine the type, amount, and duration of the exposure. A person who has been exposed to radiation as a treatment modality or by accident has a higher incidence of certain hematologic problems. The same is true of a person who has been exposed to certain chemicals, e.g. benzene, lead, naphthalene, Phenylbutazone. These chemicals are often used by potters, dry cleaners, and people in occupations that use adhesives. Ask the patient about a history in the military. Many Vietnam War veterans were exposed to a dioxin containing defoliant agent orange, which is linked with leukemia and lymphoma. Assess the effect of the present illness on the patient's usual roles and responsibilities. Sexuality Reproductive Pattern Take a careful menstrual history from women, including the age at which menarche and menopause began. Duration and amount of bleeding, incidence of clotting and cramping, and any associated problems. Ask men if they have any problems related to impotence or prolonged erections. Ask the patient about sexual behavior that may increase the risk for HIV infection. Coping stress tolerance pattern. The patient with a hematologic problem often needs help with ADLs. Ask the patient if adequate support is available to meet daily needs. Determine the patient's usual methods of handling stress. In the patient with platelet disorders or hemophilia, the potential for hemorrhage can be so frightening that usual life patterns may be drastically curtailed, affecting the person's quality of life. Value belief pattern. Treatment for some hematologic problems involves blood transfusions or a bone marrow transplant. Determine if these treatments conflict with the patient's value belief system, including the patient's cultural and religious beliefs related to blood and blood transfusions. Notify the HCP if you identify any conflicts. Objective data. Physical examination. 
Complete physical examination is needed to accurately examine all systems that affect or are affected by the hematologic system. A patient's presenting symptoms may not immediately point to a hematologic problem. For example, paresthesias of the lower extremities may not appear to be a hematologic problem, but when combined with other findings and risk factors, may indicate cobalamin deficiency and resulting pernicious anemia. Although you should perform a full physical examination on patients suspected of a hematologic disorder, certain aspects of that examination are specifically relevant. These include skin, lymph nodes, spleen, and liver. Lymph node assessment. Assess lymph nodes symmetrically and take note of location, size, and centimeters. Degree of fixation, e.g. movable, fixed, tenderness, and texture. Examine superficial lymph nodes with light palpation. To assess superficial lymph nodes, lightly palpate the nodes using the pads of the fingers. Then gently roll the skin over the area and concentrate on feeling for lymph node enlargement. We cannot palpate deep lymph nodes. They are evaluated by radiologic examination. Ordinarily, lymph nodes are not palpable in adults. If a node is palpable, it should be small, 0.5 to 1 centimeter, mobile, firm, and non-tender to be considered a normal finding. A node that is tender, hard, fixed, or enlarged, regardless if it is tender or not, is an abnormal finding and needs further investigation. Tender nodes are usually a result of inflammation. Hard or fixed nodes suggest cancer. Develop a sequence when examining the lymph nodes. A convenient sequence is to start at the head and neck. First, palpate the preauricular, posterior auricular, occipital, tonsillar, submandibular, submental, superficial cervical, posterior cervical chain, deep cervical chain, and supraclavicular nodes. Next, palpate the axillary lymph nodes and pectoral, subscapular, and lateral group of nodes. Then examine the epitrochlear nodes found in the antecubital fossa between the biceps and triceps muscles. Last, palpate the inguinal lymph nodes found in the groin. Palpation of liver or spleen. The liver and spleen are normally not detectable by palpating the abdomen. An enlarged liver or spleen may be detectable by percussion or palpation. Measure the degree of liver enlargement by the number of finger breaths that extends below the rib border. The spleen may be harder to detect because of its deep location in the left abdomen. Skin assessment. Skin assessment may be a valuable source of information about the hematologic system. Examine the skin over the entire body in a symmetric manner, e.g. starting with the face and oral cavity and moving downward over the body. In patients with RBC disorders, the skin may be pale or pasty or may have a cyanotic tinge and severe anemia. Erythrocytosis often causes small vessel occlusions causing a purple mottled appearance of the face, nose, fingers, or toes. Color changes in dark-skinned persons are best assessed in the sclera, conjunctiva, buccal mucosa, tongue, lips, nail beds, and palms. Clubbing of the fingers can be seen with chronic anemia. WBC disorders may cause infectious or cancerous skin lesions. They may occur anywhere and have a variable distribution pattern. Look for findings that can indicate bleeding disorders. Assess for petechiae, small purplish red pinpoint lesions, ecchymoses, bruising, and spider nevus, a form of telangiectasia. The location of petechiae can indicate an accumulation of blood in the skin or mucous membranes. Small vessels leak under pressure and the platelet numbers are not enough to stop the bleeding. Petechiae are more likely to occur when clothing constricts the circulation. In general, skin and mucosal bleeding means a platelet disorder, while spontaneous bleeding into joints or muscles means a coagulation factor problem. A focused assessment is used to assess the status of 
previously identified methodologic problems to monitor for signs of new problems. Diagnostic studies of hematologic system. The most direct means of evaluating the hematologic system is through laboratory analysis and other diagnostic studies. Laboratory studies. Complete blood count. The CBC involves several laboratory tests. In addition to the CBC, a peripheral smear may be done. The smear is used to look at the morphology, shape, and appearance of the blood cells and may help with the diagnosis. For example, many immature BLAST WBCs may indicate acute leukemia. Although the status of each cell type is important, diseases or treatment of diseases can disrupt the entire system. When the entire CBC is suppressed, a condition termed pancytopenia mark a decrease in the number of RBCs, WBCs, and platelets exists. Red blood cells. The total RBC count is reported as RBC times 10 to the 6th microliter. However, the total RBC count is not fully reliable in determining the adequacy of RBC function. We must evaluate other data, such as hemoglobin, hematocrit, and RBC indices. Normal values of some RBC tests are different for men and women because normal values are based on body mass. Men usually have a larger body mass than women. The hemoglobin HGB value is reduced in cases of anemia, hemorrhage, and hemodilution, such as that occurring with excess fluid volume. Increased hemoglobin is found in polycythemia or in states of hemoconcentration, which can develop from volume depletion dehydration. Reductions and evaluations of the hematocrit value and RBC count occur with the same conditions that raise and lower the hemoglobin value. The hematocrit HCT value is determined by spinning blood in a centrifuge. This causes RBCs and plasma to separate. The RBCs, being the heavier elements, settle to the bottom. The hematocrit value is the percent of RBCs compared with the total blood volume. The hematocrit value generally is three times the hemoglobin value. RBC indices are special indicators that reflect RBC volume color and hemoglobin saturation. These parameters give insight in to the cause of anemia. White blood cells. The WBC count gives two different sets of information. The first is a total count of WBCs and one microliter of peripheral blood. A WBC count over 10,000 per microliter is associated with infection, inflammation, tissue injury or death, and cancer, e.g. leukemia, lymphoma. Although the degree of WBC elevation does not necessarily predict the severity of illness, it can give clues to the cause. Extremely high WBC counts, e.g. greater than 25,000 per microliter, occur with certain types of leukemia. WBC count less than 5,000, leukopenia, is associated with bone marrow depression, severe or chronic illness and other types of leukemia. The second aspect of the WBC count, the differential count, measures the percent of each type of WBC. The WBC differential gives valuable clues in determining the cause of illness. When infections are severe, we release more granulocytes from the bone marrow as a compensatory mechanism. To meet the increased demand, many young immature Polymorphonuclear neutrophils, bands, are released into circulation. More mature neutrophils are called polymorphonuclear segmented neutrophils, SEGs. Together, bands and SEGs make up the absolute neutrophil count, ANC. The usual laboratory procedure is to report the WBCs in order of maturity, 
with the less mature forms of the left side on the left side of the written report. This is why we call the presence of many immature cells a shift to the left. The WBC differential is very important because it is possible for the total WBC count to be essentially normal despite a marked change in one type of WBC. For example, a patient may have a normal WBC count of 8800, but the differential count may show that the proportion of lymphocytes is only 10%. This is an abnormal finding that needs further investigation. When the bone marrow does not make enough neutrophils, neutropenia occurs. Neutropenia is a condition in which the ANC is less than 1000 cells per microliter. Severe neutropenia is associated with an ANC of less than 500 cells per microliter. You calculate the ANC by multiplying the total WBC count by the percentage of neutrophils. Neutropenia results from many disease processes such as leukemia or from bone marrow depression. It is associated with a high risk for infection and death from sepsis. Platelet count. The platelet count is the number of platelets per microliter of blood. Normal platelet counts are between 150,000 and 400,000 per microliter. Counts below 100,000 signify a condition termed thrombocytopenia. Bleeding may occur with thrombocytopenia. Spontaneous hemorrhage is possible once platelet counts fall below 10,000, depending on the clinical situation. Thrombocytosis is defined as too many platelets. It occurs with inflammation and some cancers. The most likely complications of thrombocytosis is excessive clotting. Blood typing and RH factor. Blood group antigens, A and B, are found only on RBC membranes. They form the basis for the ABO blood typing system. The presence or absence of one or both of the two inherited antigens is the basis for the four blood groups, A, B, AB, and O. Blood group A has A antigens. Group B has B antigens. Group AB has both antigens. And group O has neither A nor B antigens. Each person has antibodies in the serum, termed anti-A and anti-B, that react with A or B antigens. These antibodies are found when the corresponding antigen is absent from the RBC surface. For example, B antibodies are found in the serum of people with blood group A. Blood reactions based on ABO incompatibilities result from intravascular hemolysis of the RBCs. RBCs agglutinate or clump when a serum antibody is present to react with the antigens on the RBC membrane. For example, agglutination would occur in the blood of a person with type A blood if he or she receives blood transfused from a person with B antigens, i.e. type B or AB. The anti-B antibodies in the type A blood would react with the B antigens, starting the process that results in RBC hemolysis. The RH system is based on a third antigen, D, which is also on the RBC membrane. RH-positive people have the D antigen, while RH-negative people do not. RH-positive blood is indicated with a plus after the ABO group, e.g. AB-positive. RH status is determined by a Coombs test. Because of transfusion therapy or during childbirth, a RH-negative person may be exposed to RH-positive blood. After exposure during childbirth, a RH negative mother forms an antibody, anti D, which acts against RH antigens, 
Rh-positive people normally have no anti-D. In future pregnancies, the mother's anti-D antibodies can cross the placenta and attack the RBCs of a Rh-positive fetus, causing hemolysis of the RBCs. A pregnant Rh-negative woman should receive a Rho D immune globulin Rogam injections to prevent anti-D antibodies from forming. Iron metabolism. The laboratory tests used to evaluate iron metabolism include serum iron, total iron binding capacity, TIBC, serum ferritin, and transferrin saturation. Tests for nutritional deficiencies leading to defective RBC production may be done. Serum iron is a measurement of the amount of protein-bound iron circulating in the serum. TIBC gives a measurement of all proteins that act to bind or transport iron between the tissues and bone marrow. Although this indirect measurement is a general reflection of the amount of transferrin present in the circulation, it overestimates transferrin levels by 16 to 20 percent because it measures other proteins that can bind iron. These alternative proteins bind iron only when transferrin is more than half saturated. TIBC varies inversely with tissue iron stores. It is higher when iron stores are low and lower when iron stores are high. Transferrin saturation is a better indicator of the availability of iron for erythropoiesis than serum iron. Unlike serum iron, the iron bound to transferrin is readily available for the body to use. You calculate transferrin saturation by dividing serum iron by TIBC and multiplying by 100. For example, a patient with a serum iron level of 100 micrograms per deciliter and a TIBC of 300 micrograms per deciliter would have a transferrin saturation of about 33%. Under normal conditions, the serum ferritin concentration correlates closely with body iron stores. In normal patients, one nanogram per milliliter of ferritin corresponds to eight to 10 milligrams of stored iron. Biopsies. Biopsy procedures specific to hematologic assessment are bone marrow examination and lymph node biopsy. In general, these procedures are done when a peripheral blood smear is nonspecific. Furthermore, a biopsy provides information that is needed for diagnosis and treatment planning. Bone marrow examination. Bone marrow examination is important in evaluating many hematologic problems. It may involve aspiration only or aspiration with biopsy. The benefits gained from bone marrow examination are one, a full evaluation of hematopoiesis and two, the ability to get specimens from cytopathologic and chromosomal analysis. The preferred site for both aspiration and biopsy of bone marrow is the posterior iliac crest. A physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant can perform a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. The patient may receive local anesthesia and sedation to minimize anxiety and pain. For bone marrow aspiration, the skin over the puncture site is cleansed with a bactericidal agent. The skin, subcutaneous tissue, and periosteum are injected with a local anesthetic agent. Once the area is anesthetized, a bone marrow needle is inserted through the cortex of the bone. The stylet of the needle is then removed. The hub is attached to a 10 milliliter syringe, and 0.2 to 0.5 milliliters of the fluid marrow is aspirated. The patient will have pain when the periosteum is penetrated and with aspiration. Although the pain will last only a few seconds, it can be quite uncomfortable. After the marrow aspiration, the needle is removed. 
Pressure is applied over the aspiration site to ensure hemostasis. Then the site is covered with a sterile pressure dressing. Although complications of bone marrow aspiration are minimal, there is a chance of damaging underlying structures. Other complications include hemorrhage, if the patient is thrombocytopenic, and infection, if the patient is leukopenic. Monitor the patient's vital signs until stable and assess site for excess drainage or bleeding. If bleeding is present, have the patient lie on that side for 30 to 60 minutes to keep pressure on the site. If the bed is too soft, have the patient lie on a rolled towel to provide more pressure. You may give analgesics for post-procedure pain. Soreness over the puncture site for three to four days after the procedure is normal. Lymph node biopsy. Lymph node biopsy involves obtaining lymph tissue for histologic examination to determine the diagnosis and help plan therapy. This may be done by either an open biopsy or a closed needle biopsy. If the results from a needle biopsy are negative, it may only mean that the cancer cells were not part of the tissue in the biopsy specimen. However, a positive finding may be enough evidence for confirming a diagnosis. This technique is rarely used to confirm an initial diagnosis because larger specimens, such as excisional biopsies, are usually needed to perform cytopathologic tests. Molecular Cytogenetics and Gene Analysis Testing for specific genetic or chromosomal variations in hematologic conditions is often helpful in diagnosing and staging. These results help determine treatment options and prognosis. A large number of abnormal cells are circulating in the blood, such as in acute leukemia. These tests may be done on peripheral blood. However, testing is usually done on samples from bone marrow, lymph node biopsies, and sometimes cerebrospinal fluid. For example, fluorescence in situ hybridization fish identifies genetic defects using nucleic probes that are complementary to a targeted region of DNA. It can identify an abnormal extra chromosome 8, which is common in certain leukemias. Chromosomal karyotyping allows each of set of chromosomes to be painted different colors. This helps identify normal from abnormal banding patterns. It can be used to identify the translocation of chromosomes 22 to 9 in the Philadelphia chromosome of chronic myelogenous leukemia.